Good morning, Bay Life. How are we? Good morning. Wow. Middle school students, you get to hear from me either way. I promise I'll try not to embarrass you too bad, right? Man, what a day. Anybody notice anything different about this room? Anybody over here need to move? We'll give you a second. Everything is like reverse, isn't it? And I didn't, I didn't think about this shirt being plaid and dashes all over the wall. You know, if you, if you get a headache by the time we're done today, I'm sorry. But, um, hey, you know, people who serve, of course, uh, Ryan and Haley lay out this incredible wall back here. Isn't that crazy? Amen. Now, the unrelated gardeners, right, the brains of the operation, the unrelated gardeners, Keith and uh, Scott, uh, Put that together, and we're not even finished yet. There's more, so uh, make sure you're back next week. And um, man, who knows what's going to be on these walls? But um, we are starting new series. We are the church because we say there's a new season coming, right? There's if you walk outside. I don't know if we're in the hotter, hotter than hot season or just the hot season, but it's hot. And we talk about kids going back to school, as Pastor Brian said earlier. Kids are going back to school, but fall is nowhere to be found, right? It's hot out there. Tomorrow, when we're burning hot dogs at Daphne High School, it's going to be incredibly hot. But, um, you know, as we do, we get back to school. We start talking about a new season, especially, you know, in church world, we know that people, um, you know, come back to church Maybe we get back into our own spiritual disciplines. We um, get back to our own routine. And we're going to remind ourselves of some things that need to be true as, as a group of Christ followers. What are we supposed to be for our community as we lead in what? To find and follow. That's, that's what we're about, helping the people here on the on Eastern Shore find and follow God. So these next couple of weeks... Yes, maybe a little bit of a refresher for us, but um, today we're going to talk a little bit about serving. As Pastor Brian told you about the little card, we're going to get to that at the very end. You know, back in the day, there was this rule of thumb. Right back when, you know, we were younger, Pastor Brian, there was this rule of thumb. It says this, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I've been a part of churches where that is true, where a handful of people carry the load of the whole, you know, of the whole church. Maybe you've been a part of a, a sports organization, or uh, maybe we were band parents at one time, and you like a 200-member band. There's a small group of people, probably 40 people, who carried the load. 20% of the people carrying that incredible amount. Maybe you've been a part of an organization where that was true. You were a part of that small group. Maybe when you signed on to that group, you were excited. It didn't matter if you were, you know, a part of that 20%. But eventually, what? Frustration builds in, doesn't it? You don't feel appreciated. You feel overwhelmed. And even as it goes for the success of the organization, you just can't keep up. And disaster is right down the road. You know, if you're a part of Bay Life for any amount of time, you know that we're not trying to build our church on this principle. Amen. Not at all. If you've been a part of Bay Life for any amount of time, you know that we offer this environment called Engage, right? Because we want every person that calls Bay Life home to be fully engaged in that environment. Right before you fall asleep after eating, I'm at the end of that, that talk, uh, I cover some things uh, as it relates to being fully engaged here at Bay Life Church. Let's just review these real quick. The first one, we asked you to invest and invite. Leverage your relationships, your world, where you live. Invest in people that you know best for an opportunity for a gospel conversation but also to invite them to be a part of Bay Life Church. We ask you to invest and invite. We ask everyone to serve on a Bay Life team, to jump in and find your place to serve, to connect in a small group, to move from these rows 
into small groups where we can grow deeper in God's word and grow deeper with each other. Pastor Rob's going to talk a little bit about that next week. And of course, we all also say that everyone, we need to give of our financial resources for the ministry here of this local church. Now, I'm going to probably give you something that might be new to you, but you know, we're expanding. Maybe you've heard, but as we expand, we've got to adjust the model just a little bit. And let's look at this on the screen. Kind of a tweak to our model. And, that, and this, we see it here. The ministry, the ministry of Bay Life, the ministry of Bay Life is lay-led and staff-equipped. What does that look like? Well, it's biblical, right? That as pastors, as leaders, we're to equip the body, the believers, for the work, the ministry of the church. It's not an all-star stage where we do all the work. We're equippers. And, you know, a lot of times we're good and not so good at that to equip you for the ministry of the local church. And that's where we have to start moving towards because we see that certainly in Scripture. You know, the body is uh, described in, in the New Testament, the church, the body. Everyone has a role to play. Every member, you know, hands, feet, you know, big toes, everyone has a role to carry. And we want to be a New Testament church where that is true. You know, we talk about the 80-20 rule, 20-80 rule, and Pastor Brian alluded to this in just a few minutes ago. Kind of stole my thunder a little bit. Preacher man, right? Can't help himself. But um, maybe you're wondering, right? How are we looking when it comes to, you know, serving here at Bay Life Church? What are the exact numbers as it relates to us as a, as a church when it comes to serving? Well, I'll tell you. Currently, we have 120 adults serving in 140 different roles here at Bay Life Church. 120 people serving in about 140 different roles. And that doesn't even account my saints, right? The people who serve for Baldwin. We have somewhere around 90 people that serve for, in our For Baldwin um, initiative. That is really, really good. That's incredible. But we also know that God has entrusted to us what not every church, you know, understands, and that's growth. We're growing as a church, and it'll always be that tension between onboarding people to keep up with the people that God is bringing to us. So there'll always be the tension of bringing people up to speed and finding a place to serve. And that's true across the board for any growing church. And, you know, there's been countless uh, seminars uh, offered books written. How do we get people to follow through and to serve in a local church? Well, guess what? I was thinking that maybe today, at the end of this talk, I'll have a divine revelation, and I will write the last book, right? The very last book on how to get people to serve. And Pastor Brian, when that book hits the you know, New York Times bestseller list, <laughs> I'll finance the next two Bay Life campuses. How about that? <laughs> that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Well, the frustration that I feel today is, is that's not going to happen. But if I wrote the book, I would have to maybe give some reasons why I believe people don't serve. And if you know me, I can be a little sarcastic. This is where Sarah gets nervous, okay? <laughs> Just a tad. But what would be on my list? Let's, let's run through a couple of them. Let's look at the first one. People don't serve because we don't ask. And hey, confession time, I am right up there at the top. I don't want you to mess up what God has told me to do, right? <laughs> we don't ask because we think it's our deal. We don't ask you because we just do it ourselves. And that's wrong. From this side is sin. We don't ask you. We don't involve you. Why well, just do it? You have a problem asking me. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. Which brings us to the second one. 
We try and guilt people. <laughs> Man, this is priceless. Thank you, Jeff. We do. We try to guilt people. We'll have a story about the children, right? If someone doesn't go over there and help the children, yeah, that's an easy one. I had a great idea. I was going to put a live video feed over in the nursery. And I was going to let Pastor Brian lead the babies for the hour. Wouldn't that be incredible? Well, no, it wouldn't. Because as I was thinking about it, most of those kids over there are his anyway, right? <laughs> That's just another day in the life of pipping. I wish Haley would let me play the drums. <laughs> if I played the drums, hey, you would be signing up for drum lessons, right? Your third cousin would probably come and play the drums for us. But me playing the drums wouldn't do anything but make everybody mad. And we can't guilt people. Because when we guilt people in there, there's no fulfillment in that. And if we've guilted you into something, you can, you can resign today and find what God has uniquely gifted you to do. We can't guilt you into something, maybe once, but there is no fulfillment in that. And the last thing is this. We don't share ownership. And we talk about lay, you know, lay led. We're about to share the ownership Amen. because that's the biblical model, not for the, the pastoral you know, all stars to be up here leading. But it's for everyone to take ownership. You walk across the parking lot, you see a piece of paper. What owners pick it up? We see something that's not, not you know, in the right place. We take ownership. There's a need, we fill it. We've been bad about not sharing ownership. But you know, it could be just as simple as Maybe you don't understand how valuable you are to God. How valuable you are to your creator. That you've been given unique ability, abilities and talents for a reason. God has got you here on this earth for a reason. And we see that all the way back to the Garden of Eden, don't we? Adam and Eve, fellowship with God. But they were also given the task of managing the garden. They were overseers of the garden. I like, um, I love this verse in Ephesians where Paul says about what we're to be doing here on this earth. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's workmanship, his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance for us. Man, that's a lot, isn't it? We're God's handiwork. We're God's craftsmanship. And because of Jesus, as we come in relationship with him, he's prepared good works for us to do way in advance before we even made it to this earth. If that's true, then I am happiest, find most joy and satisfaction when I'm living out what he has designed me for. So this morning, as we talk about why are we here? Why should we serve? We're going to look at a parable in uh, Matthew 25. You can go ahead and uh, start moving in that direction if you want to. But Jesus tells a story about what it means to be a part of his world, his kingdom. And why are we here? What are we to be doing with what he has given us? In Matthew 25, we see the parable. Maybe in your, in your Bible, it says the parable of the talents. So um, let's, just, let's just go to verse 14. And we'll get started, and then I'll kind of fill in uh, backfill behind this. The parable of talents begins like this. It says, it, it will be like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted to him his wealth. So in this story, God is represented by the owner, the wealthy owner who brings his servants in. He says, I want to divide up my wealth with my servants. Now, in your Bible, maybe it says, like we just said, the parable of the talents. But you know, for us, what does that mean? Well, we're going to see that there's um, bags of gold involved in this. But you know, for us, as we've kind of told this parable over the last 2,000 years, 
we can just surmise for us in our application today, a, pair, I mean, a talent will be anything uh, like our abilities, our resources, our opportunities, how he's uniquely created us, you know, abilities, resources, opportunities, and what we do, how we invest them. So he calls them all together, and he divides his wealth with them. Let's look at the next verse. It says this, to one, he gave five bags of gold, to the other, two bags, and to another, one bag, each according to his ability. Isn't it interesting? He brings in three guys, but he doesn't divide the wealth equally. It's his discretion in it. It's his money. But he also says, according to his ability. He knows these three guys. He's watched them. He's you know, maybe taking note of their character. He knows all about them. And he disperses his resources totally at his discretion. You know, um, for us as Christ followers, we have opportunities, abilities, right? We also have a spiritual gift. In Romans 12, it says this. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. We have different gifts according to what? Grace, not anything you know, that we could possibly do on our own without any merit. You know, we have been given a spiritual gift to use for his glory. Three guys, different disbursements. But there's not a single you know, person in here who doesn't have a talent. There's no, zero, none. There are no, no talent people. Everyone has something to benefit the kingdom. You know, as we continue on in this story, I want us to grab three life principles, and then we'll get back to my book for just a second. <laughs> but three life principles that we can take away from this parable. The first one we're going to see as we advance on through the, um, the story is this, the principle of accountability. The principle of accountability. Now, obviously, the guy didn't divide his wealth and say, hey, you know, this is payment for something. This is payment for your, your, your past work. He divides his money expecting a return from these guys. Now, what does this word here you know, kind of stir inside of you? Accountability. Now, some of us may think, man, I hate that word. Accountability. I don't like that. It kind of makes me nervous. But if you think about accountability, what's the flip side of accountability? Trust. If there was no trust, no accountability. He entrusted his livelihood. He entrusted everything that he had to those guys. And now it's time for them to account for what he's entrusted to them. One day, we'll be accountable, won't we? One day, we'll have to stand you know, for the audit. And God's going to ask us, what did you do with what I've entrusted to you? You know, Pastor Brian mentioned this just a few weeks ago when we were talking about the end, right? In the end, we will stand in, you know, in the judgment. But let's be clear. We cannot work our way to Christ. The finished work on the cross, you know, once and for all, our destination, heaven, that is set, that is set in stone. But from the time we come to faith to the time we take our last breath, what do we do with that? How do we invest that? Well, let's look a little bit deeper into the, um, the accountability. Let's look at the scripture again. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled the accounts with them. Now, let's look at the next uh, slide of scripture. The man who received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's continue. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. 
Man, things were going great, right? The first two guys step up double. The first two guys step up double what they were entrusted with. They worked hard and they were successful. Now, the story is about to take a big, big turn because the next guy, if you know the story at all, the next guy had a totally different approach, didn't he? Let's look at the scripture and see what happened to the third guy. Then the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Wow. So I was afraid. I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here it is, what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. What a difference. All three guys had the same basic you know, task. The first two, double. The last, lazy. The last, you know what? I'm just going to go dig a hole, drop it in there. I'm just going to go you know, do as little as I can. And, of course, the response is, you know, lazy, wicked, servant. You know, his sin was this simple inactivity, nothing, lazy. But you know, you wonder, what was he thinking? What was he thinking when the, when the master gave him the task, the investment? What was he, you know, I'm just going to go, I'm, I'm going to take the safest route possible, and this was the safest route <laughs> to go dig a hole and put it in there. But can we honor God? And do nothing? Take a risk? You know, maybe, is it true? Without faith, it's impossible to what? Please, God. So what was going on in this guy? Why did he do absolutely nothing? Well, I think if we dig a little bit deeper, deeper, um, there may be a couple other things in play. Maybe a couple other reasons other than the stated reason of fear. He made some judgments about the guy, didn't he? He really did. There are a couple that I see. I think the first one is indifference or apathy. You've got all this money, he might say. You're the wealthy man. You've got all this money, and you want me to take one bag and do what? What could I possibly do for you with just one Back. I've been a part of a lot of churches, and if you've been around, you know, for any amount of time, maybe you've been a part of a church where you see that indifference and apathy, or even in a true organization. If I don't show up, nobody will even miss me. They don't need me. Anybody can watch kids, right? Anybody. Cook a hot dog? Jeez, how hard is that? Somebody else will step up. They burn a few. They'll, they'll get another guy in there, you know. Cut the grass? Who even notices? No one will ever miss me. Somebody else will step up. It's not my responsibility. I've got a life of my own. That's what the one bad guy probably was thinking, wasn't it? Or how about Comparison. We may not admit this, but we do compare. We walk around and compare. Look at that guy. He has five. I've got one. Hey, those people on the stage at Bay Life, those are five bag people. But you know what? I'm just as good as that two bag person over there, and they have double what I was given. That's not fair, is it? Hey, you give me five, I'm going to step up. I'll take care. You give me that uh, ability, I'll step up. But why couldn't the one guy just simply say, you know what? Thank you, God, that I've been considered faithful, faithful with even just my one. And I'm going to show that guy what I can do with one. 
Attitude is everything in it. Well, there's one last um, principle that I want us to look at this morning, and that is the principle of compensation. The principle of compensation. Question for you. If you don't use it, could you lose it? If you don't use what you've been given, could you lose it? Well, in this story, uh, this afternoon, look at verse 28. It says the guy with one had to give his one bag to the guy with ten. The rich get richer, don't they? (laughs) But if we don't use what God has entrusted us, why would he give us anything else? You know, you, you, you think about maybe, well, you shouldn't be thinking about the comp, you know, compensation. Well, why not? I'm in his kingdom. One day I'll stand before him, and I'm looking for what? A couple of things. The first one we see in the story, affirmation. Affirmation. You know, we probably have a hard time understanding affirmation. Hey, if I do something, you go, appreciate it. That's it. Thanks, man. Or thanks, bud. You know, just flippant affirmation. How about an emoji? Let me give you like five thumbs up. Is that more than one, you know? But the affirmation from our Heavenly Father is this. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's going to mean something when you're standing before your Creator And he looks at you and says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's big time. The second one's promotion. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. That goes back to the use it or lose it principle, doesn't it? (laughs) I'm going to give you more. Don't you love this thing about the, the Old Testament? Guys, where this principle is true, you know, maybe David, you know, um, he was a DoorDash guy, right? Remember David, the DoorDash guy? He just delivers, you know, lunch to his brothers, kills the giant, becomes king. Faithful with a little advances to greatest king ever. How about Daniel? He refused to eat. And because of his faithfulness about his diet, he's entrusted with so much more. Joseph, same thing. You know, shepherd, the bottom of the heap, responsible for a nation surviving, you know, a drought, a famine. Faithfulness with a few things. And the last one, celebration. Man, you ever been on a team that won? Well, you're Alabama fans, right? (laughs) Okay. I just had to do it, right? Just had to. But, hey, come and share your master's happiness. Come and share the celebration. Let's have a party. Share your master's happiness because collectively you've won. The joy that comes from our master, the joy that we have, from success. Come and share that happiness. You know, this morning, um, we look at this parable, and I guess it boils down to maybe a few things when it comes to our life. You know, we waste it on um, things that are, you know, that are not eternal. We spend it. You know, we, we build our own kingdom. Or we can invest it. Invest it. And it's something that is eternal that will far, far, far outlive us. That's what, you know, this parable is talking about. You know, um, when I was given this assignment, I know that if you teach God's word, and that's been, you know, my goal today is to clearly teach God's word. God's word can change Your heart, the Holy Spirit can oppress upon you. I can't guilt you or change you. But it's so frustrating sometimes, you know, as a a preacher dude, 
what's it going to take, right, to push you over the edge from just attending on the weekend to being fully engaged to serving? So I thought about, you know, my, uh, my book. I give a whole chapter to just one word. Love. One word. Love. Now, our, our world, we have, we have no clue what it means. We've misrepresented the word love. But I do know that love is powerful. Love can make time stand still when you experience a new love or a first love. Time stands still when you're doing something that you really, really love. Old grumpy men do weird things when they're in front of their grandkids, right, because of love. When it comes to love, there is no sacrifice too great. Love fills that void in our heart. Maybe I um, would um, describe it like this. Love is the fuel. Love's the fuel that drives our life's engine. Love is what gets us up. Love's that fuel that drives our life's engine. And I can illustrate this to you. I hope I can do it and get through it. Because there's people in this room, there's people at our church where this is so incredibly true. Back on May 20th, we had a huge serve day here in um, Bay Life. And, um, you know, on that, um, at leading up to that event, we asked all of our small group leaders to sign people up. We've got two huge four events. We've got one in the morning with the city of Daphne and one in the afternoon with Spring Run. And after that mega day, looking back, I thought about people who served that day. Incredible, incredible group of people. There was um, someone who had to borrow the only car that was running in their family, the only operable car in their family. They borrowed their college student's car to come in to serve. There was someone who had to secure for themselves um, child care for a young child to be at an early morning event. They took the responsibility of child care. There was someone who was in the middle of caring for two immediate family members. Their last days here on this earth. They stopped to serve. There was a, um, a family with a teenager who wasn't feeling the love. But they brought their teenager at 6.30 in the morning and they demonstrated love. People who travel extensively during the week, high-pressure jobs, even out of the country, came to serve. They served without their spouse because of health limitations. And get this, there was one couple who was in the middle of two grandchildren being born in two different states, total chaos, They decided to help us put up a basketball goal for kids they didn't even know. That's true. And that doesn't even mention the people who, are, who have gone through physical challenges that serve on a weekly basis here. Love is the, is the fuel that drives our life's engine. One more statement at the end of my book. I'd have to boil it down to this. We give time, treasure, and talent to the things that we love. We give time, treasure, and talent to the things that we love. Our problem is there's so many things that we love, right? I love football. You might love, love to work. We love recreation. We love to fish and to hunt. We love to do endless activities. We love our family. But it really 
boils down to this. We give time, treasure, and talent to the things we love the most. Isn't that true? Time, treasure, and talent to the things that make it to the top of our love list. What's at the top of your list? And how much will it move the needle of eternity? Because I should love the things that God loves, right? God loves and sent his son for his church. Not just Bay Life, but for people's eternity. I've got to move my love list compared to his. I want to pray for us, and then I want to talk about that card just for a second. God, um, we thank you for our time to get today. God, I pray that um, you would help us maybe just examine our own life. God, what is the thing that we love most and how does it relate to what you love? God, I pray that you would um, change hearts, change lives according to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. Now, the card that you have, I want to walk through it with you real quick as Pastor Brian uh, did earlier. just want to make sure we're clear on this. You know, at the top, of course, you know, your name and then the areas where you're serving. And hey, if you've been guilty of that, you may put on the areas I'm leaving. Please don't ever leave, don't everybody leave uh, the nursery. Um, we'll be in trouble next week. But um, the areas where you're serving. And then we break it down, the different aspects of ministry here on this card. You know, this card might be overwhelming to you. Well, how do we start? Is there a starting point? Well, yes. This coming week, Pastor Brian said there was only one thing left, but hey, there's two. That's the reason why I do what I do and he does what he does, right? Now, there's two. Tomorrow at lunch, anywhere from 10 to 1, if you want to smile, pass out hot dogs to 500 incoming freshmen at Daphne High School, love to have you right in the middle of the day. Now, Saturday, um, we've kind of almost um, missed our friends at Shelbrook Point Apartments. That's the other apartment complex on the other side of the highway. But um, Miss Barbara is such an awesome lady there. And um, we're going to do a water day, like a family cookout, just for a couple hours next Saturday, 5 to 7, at Shellbrook Point. You can put that on your, on your card. Or um, as um, Haley always tells us, go to that social media, go to all of our, our, our platforms, and you can sign up for those two things. Simple as for Baldwin, bring your kids to something as simple as Shellbrook Point. And let them jump on a slide. If they walk down, if they, you know, have fun on a water slide, they're serving. They're watching you serve. It's really, really important. The other thing uh, Pastor Rob's going to talk about next week, the pipeline for communication, it runs through our small groups. Be thinking now about being a part of a small group because that's where, like I said, the pipeline of information a lot of times runs through there. But maybe get along. What's most important? coming up in this next season. What's most important? What do you love most? Hey, I want to pray real quick for us as we head out the door. God, thank you for this day. God, um, challenge us to be what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. See you next week. The guys in the back have baskets. They'll take those cards because they won't fit in the black box. Thank you. I don't want to be afraid Every time I face the way